The Bounty Hunters Young lady, I know you can see me through the camera there, Ivan says, looking right into the lens of the security camera. I can sense your axiom presence. There is no answer from the speakers. Seven, I know you can hear and see me. Open the door. We need to talk. No answer. Seven, I know you're at the security station watching me in there. I am Ivan Grace, the man from whom Iva Grace was cloned from. Open this door. This is important. There is a swirl of emotions deeper in the building and they settle on defiance. All right then, the hard way it is. Seven, you have 10 seconds to begin unlocking this door or I'm coming in regardless. You can welcome me in or I can break in. Your choice. Ivan gives his ultimatum and begins counting down out loud from 10. There is no answer. All right then, time for some destruction. He compresses gravity above his left palm and the area begins to distort before collapsing in on itself and kicking up a ferocious wind. He reorients his palm so it faces the barred door and lets the black hole launch forward into the reinforced hypercrete and solid tungsten bars. The cracking and crunching sounds are somewhat unpleasant to the ear, but the sight of the massively reinforced door collapsing in on itself and being pulled into an area no larger than the point of a pin is very satisfying. He sweeps the area with the black hole and ensures that he has all the debris before folding space around it and letting the black hole loose. The explosion is contained in the folded space and allows only a small amount of energy out at any one time. A large explosion is dangerous. A long, steady release of gas and dust is a little dirty but harmless. The sheer panic from inside the bunker is rather impressive as he walks in, and he can sense her grab something that's moderately familiar to his senses. The tiny Cobe child slides around a corner, dragging a laser cannon on an anti-gravity booster behind her. Suck laser's evil door. The beam of light is interrupted by a distortion in space in front of it as not even light can truly escape a black hole, no matter how agitated it is. He sends it down the beam and it sucks up all the threat until it reaches the muzzle of the weapon and it's ripped out of Seven's grip and reduced to a memory. Space folds around this black hole as well and the energy and debris is safely contained as this second black hole is detonated. Am I going to have to break anything else or are you willing to talk now, young lady? Ivan asks, and Seven rushes deeper into the bunker. Let the damage continue then. Three more steps in and he carefully steps over a trip wire, noting that it's being used to keep back a fillet knife on tension. Little lady is out for blood. He takes the knife off the tension band and then disengages the rest of the simple trap. He begins wondering exactly what Seven's specialization is. She certainly has a vicious edge to her that her siblings lacked. He loathes the very idea of hurting any of these abused children, but he likes the idea of standing by as one of them brutalizes the others even less. Her next trap is clever and far more sophisticated. There is a maintenance drone that seems powered down, but is actually in a low power observation mode. It also has a massively reinforced left arm. As he steps close, it activates and swings at him in an instant. Unfortunately, he's rather good at tampering with space and distances, and while he's easily in arm's reach of the drone, he's also several kilometers away and thoroughly out of attack range. It takes three wild swings at him before trying to dive on top of him and vanishing into the folded space. He just moves on as the doofy and badly programmed machine tries to get past the few thousand error messages that bit of Axiom fuckery just gave it. Eventually, it hits a return home routine and leaves the folded space to power down in its spot again. He moves past that momentary entertainment and ducks under a tripwire setup near shoulder level. This one is keeping a hammer suspended in the air and is the most simple trap to disarm yet. He can't help but be vaguely impressed that she set this up so quickly. Three more steps past this trap and he turns before pushing aside a mostly empty case of rations 
and meets the gaze of the formerly hidden Seven. Are you done, or do you want some more time to set up pointless traps? He asks her and she just stares at him. She then tries to wrestle a laser pistol to point at him, but he's bigger, faster, stronger, and better coordinated. The pistol is his in just a few moments and she ends up nursing a mildly sore hand. All right, enough of this young lady. I don't know where you got the idea that acting this way was appropriate, but clearly you need a firm hand to set you on the right path. Seven just stares at him. Out of the shelf, young lady. You will not like it if I have to reach in there and pull you out. She does not move. Seven, I'm trying to be nice. Don't make this harder than it has to be. About two minutes later, he's wrestling with a screaming, spitting, clawing child who apparently decided that she was more closely related to some kind of rabid feline than a proper cobe. He takes the matter still in the folded space he's carrying with him and reforms them into bonds to tie her still as he hefts her onto his shoulder and begins leaving the bunker. This did not have to end this way seven. If you had used your words instead of traps and claws, then you would be spared this indignity. He says to the girl who's been as much muzzled as everything else, being spat on once was more than enough thank you. Oh, oh wow, what happened? One asks as he walks up to the shuttle with Seven still over his shoulder. She bites and spits. He responds simply before breaking the restraints and she immediately starts trying to claw at him. As you can see, he places her into the middle of the shuttle and she lunges at him to try and knock him down. No dice. Hey, 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 hey. Two protests and Seven turns to glare at her. Why are you so angry? He broke my home. I'm trying to give you a better one. Ivan replies. You didn't say that. You weren't listening. Ivan replies. Now that we've gotten you talking though, I am Ivan Grace. I am the creator of Iva Grace, and as she was your creator, this makes me your grand creator. Eva committed many crimes and died for them. This means that you're under my protection now. Well, where were you before? He was trapped in an egg by Eva. She did that before she even made us. One says softly, and Seven just starts looking around. I'm one. This is two. Those two are four and eleven. We know you're seven and we're going to get ten next. But I, I was keeping track of every ship coming and going on the planet, looking out for major threats and seeing what kind of product was, I mean, logistical analysis and survey, Ivan notes. That's a powerful skill, but one that's very easy to underestimate. How does that fit into the traps? What? They don't, I just like them? They make sense? I can't fight an Axiom Adept, but I can be smarter. That's a very good philosophy, but you need to make sure you're actually smarter first. But if that's what you want to do with your life, that can be done. What? I'm not your enemy, Seven. I'm your grandfather. I'm on your side. I don't understand, Seven says, and he puts a hand on her head fondly. You'll figure it out soon enough. Don't worry. Ivan says kindly before his communicator goes off and he examines the message. Ah, that'll keep you girls occupied while I go to fetch ten. What will? Four asks and he hands her his communicator. He shuts the shuttle door and scoots around them to get into the cockpit. People of Albreth, we have suffered greatly during the past few years. The planetary official Rebecca Gemscale says over a backdrop of the planetary flag. The abstract triangular symbol had gotten some raised eyebrows from the humans as they just needed a circle and to be rounded to be a literal warning sign. But again, big galaxy. Lots of overlap. We have all lost friends and family. Our homes have been stolen from us and we have dwelt in despair due to the wretched actions of Vasuda's Moshrut, she says, and there's a reflexive wince, but nothing else. But as you can see, that horror has passed us. One of our sisters, Edith Plumage, gave her life to send out the call for help, a call that was answered. The Greater Plains Nagasha woman holds her arms up in triumph. 
They systematically tracked down the source of the death field and slaughtered the abomination sustaining it. You all remember the scream some days ago? That was their final horror, the greatest of their number emerging to try and do battle with them and dying. They slaughtered it as well with a deadly poison. She seems to calm down and lowers herself back to the podium. Rising up on her tail in triumph is impressive, but it takes her away from the microphones. If they had simply slaughtered the beast responsible for our despair, it would have been enough, but they did not. They located and tracked down the woman responsible. They found her out and were beginning to question her. That a hollow daughter emerged to slaughter her before they could ask any questions doesn't matter. They had her. That would have been enough to earn the moniker of hero, but they did not stop there. They went on the hunt for every trace of her foul influence. Had they simply kept us up to date and tracked down where the next part was, that would have been enough. But they went beyond again. They tracked down the ultimate experiment and first victim of the wretched monster and reduced the entire moon. It was on into a memory. So please, I ask you to welcome Captain Gregory Schmidt, leader of the heroes of Albrith, captain of the Chainbreaker and a member of the newest military polity in the galaxy, the Undaunted. She moves to the side and Pukey walks up with a smile and a shake of his head. His cybernetic eye and arm are visible and he's dressed in his uniform minus the jacket to show that he's still somewhat armed and dangerous. Pointedly, his plasma sword has apparently been replaced and its replacement was on a chest-mounted holster. All in all, it made him look dangerous and grizzled, but his relaxed nature made it approachable. All right, all right. That's enough building me up. Pretty much everything I have to say is going to be part of the information release packet anyway, so I'm just hitting the major points for all those that find such documents to be boring. Anyways, first to those that can recognize the ship profile, yes. The Chainbreaker used to be the Chaining, the slaver vessel that hit Albreth 50 years ago. They made their last mistake when they gave me a small amount of wiggle room after taking me as a slave. It cost me an arm and an eye, but I successfully burnt down several major buildings and led a slave revolt to take the ship. Those that look at the ship's crew will also find some locals have signed up for our ship, and yes, they were of great help in the operation to tear down the death field. Pukey takes a bit of a breath and nods. To those that want to be recruited, the news is both good and bad. Bad in that we will be focused on repairing our ship and training our current new recruits too much to spare for others, but also good in that your government has agreed for a recruiting and training outpost of the Undaunted to be opened on Albrith. This outpost will be up and operational before we leave, meaning that from this day forward, Albrith has a standing army willing to defend it. He lets that sit for a moment before nodding. Now, for many of you, that leaves only two main issues, cleanup and justice. The cleanup is something the Undaunted will be helping with. We use gas weapons in this operation. And while the use was more than justified considering the scale of the threat, there's still a weapon we are very, very careful about. A decontamination initiative will be arriving alongside other relief efforts to neutralize whatever's left of the poison we used. The issue of justice is a bit more interesting, so I'll simply explain things fully. He holds up a communicator and the image of Iva Grace appears over it. Meet Iva Grace, the deranged clone and cloner who tried to create some kind of living god in her derangement. She is very, very dead, killed in front of me by a hollow. One we have determined was summoned by the woman Armanda Bullstrin. Not that Iva would have lived hollow or otherwise, but it would have been nice to interrogate the wretch a little. Iva Grace had some hidden victims, however. The first among their number was Ivan Grace, the man from whom she was cloned from. She attacked him while he was in a restorative coma and stripped him of everything but his life. She then stole his identity and used it to begin her plans. Her other batch of hidden victims were further clones she herself made in her insane bid for godhood. These 12 clones are to the last, innocent and ignorant, 
We are effecting their rescue even now with the aid of the fully restored Ivan Grace. While she lived, Iva Grace, or Great Zero as she seemed to call herself at times, did nothing but bring pain and suffering to others. But she failed to break this world. She failed to break you. She lost. You have won. You outlasted the monster and now is the time of rebuilding. Now is the time we soldier on. Let this piece of filth be left forgotten in the skein of history. A wretch like Eva is worth no more than excrement on a boot. Wipe her away and press ever onwards. Albreth stands. Even as they fly over the city, the cheer is loud enough to be heard in the shuttle above. I didn't know he took public speaking lessons, Ivan notes to himself.